Okay, we now come to peptic ulcer disease proper. This diagram shows you the lower end of the esophagus, the stomach, and the first part of the duodenum. Okay, this is the area where these ulcers occur, and the ulcers are known as peptic ulcer. Okay, peptic ulcer is a mucosal break in the lining of the stomach, small intestine, or the esophagus. Gastric ulcer is a peptic ulcer in the stomach. Duodenal ulcer is a peptic ulcer in the first part of the duodenum, and the esophageal ulcer occurs mainly in the lower end of the esophagus. The incidence of peptic ulcer is about 0.1 to 0.2 of the general population per year. Duodenal ulcers present earlier than gastric ulcers by around 20 years. And this classification of these ulcers are basically based on the present day endoscopic diagnosis. As we come to the etiology and pathogenesis of peptic ulcer, there are two factors, uh, two mechanisms that act on the gastric mucosa. And one is known as the gastric mucosal barrier, which prevents the breakdown and ulcer formation. And the other one is the mucosal damage or breakdown in the defense mechanism that promotes the development of peptic ulcer. Mucosal defense barrier consists of the surface mucus secretion and the bicarbonate ion, uh, ion release, which is alkaline and pro on the surface of the mucus, uh, mucosa, which is protective. Under the uh, destructive uh, mechanisms will be the helicobacteria pylori infection, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and certain toxic foods, alcohol, smoking, and drugs. Now, the important thing, uh, this is, uh, NSAIDs is very important because it causes peptic ulceration by inhibiting prostaglandin synthesis, okay, which results in a reduction in the secretion of uh, glycoprotein mucus, phospholipids, and gastric mucosa. So the gastric, uh, the NSAIDs, uh, break down the defense muc uh, gastric mucosal barrier and lead to ulcer. Okay, now we come to look at the types of cells that are present in the, in the stomach. Okay, there are three main types of cells, parietal cells secreting its hydrochloric acid, chief cells that produce the enzyme pepsinogen, and endocrine cells producing gastrin, histamine, and uh, somatostatin. Eh? So the mucosa of the gast stomach is thrown into numerous holes here, known as the crypts. In a closer view, you see these are the crypts, and these crypts are lined by these important cells in the stomach. The parietal cell, the chief cells, and the endocrine cells, or the ECL cells. Okay, now the different types of cells in the stomach that produce the various enzymes or hormones that are produced. The chief cells, as I said, produces pepsinogen, which is important for the digestion of proteins. The parietal cells produce hydrochloric acid. The endocrine cells, there are three main cells, and these cells are produced uh, by the ECL cells or the endochromaphene-like cells. Okay, So they produce gastrin, they produce histamine and also stomatostatin. Gastrin and histamine are stimulatory to the production of HCL, whereas stomatostatin inhibits the production of hydrochloric acid. Okay, now let's look at the gastric acid secretion in a bit more detail. Okay, now gastric acid production is due to a number of factors neurotransmitters such as estracolin, neuropeptides, and peptide hormones. The vagus nerve endings release acetylcholine, which act on the acetylcholine receptors here. Histamine by the ECL cells from the gastric mucosa the stimulate the, the H2 receptors to release uh, H2 receptor antagonists, okay? So H2 receptors. Gastrin from the G cells of the stomach will then also act on the gastrin receptors. ACH can also act directly to stimulate the parietal cell. Now, when food enters into the stomach, 
it causes the G cells to release gastrin. Okay, so the gastrin will stimulate the release of hydrochloric acid. And when the gastrin accumulates more than the allowed uh, limit, what happens? The excess gastrin will have a negative feedback on the uh, production of gastrin itself. So this is a negative feedback. Uh, uh, feedback which uh, controls the amount of gastrin that is being released. Now, this uh, picture here shows you the actual production of this acid. Okay, this is the blood, this is the lumen, and this is the parietal cell. The parietal cell has got a number of receptors, acetylcholine, histamine, and gastrin. And I said this uh, chemicals or hormones or neurotransmitters will act on this to control or speed up the speed up or, or reduce the activity that produces hormone uh, the hydrogen ions huh? okay this is a process known as the carbonic anhydrase eh? the catalyst which convert uh, water and carbon dioxide into uh, carbonic acid and this carbonic acid is split into carb bicarbonate and hydrogen ions and these hydrogen ions are taken up by the proton pump in the wall of the parietal cell it pumps the potassium uh, hydrogen into the lumen and exchanges for potassium the bicarbonate on the other hand is refluxes back into the blood the chloride from the blood crosses passes through the uh, uh, parietal cell and into the lumen of the stomach. Okay, so the carbonic uh, acid, uh, carbonic acid production is a very important mechanism to release the hydrogen. Okay, and to pump the hydrogen out is your proton pump. So proton pump is a second mechanism that is very useful. Now we come to the very important topic of uh, the proton pump that exists in the parietal cell and is very important in the regulation of acid by the parietal cell. It's also known as the hydrogen potassium ATPA system. Okay, this chart here, this uh, drawing uh, summarizes the effects. Okay, here you have the vagus nerve, it stimulates the G cells and the ECL cells, and also it stimulates its own nerve endings through the acetylcholine. Yeah? And all these things, histamine, gastrin, and acetylcholine, act on the various receptors present on the carotid cell to accelerate the release of hydrochloric acid production and release of hydrochloric acid. And the final release is regulated by the proton pump or the hydrogen potassium ATPA system where for every molecule of hydrogen that is excreted into the lumen one molecule of potassium uh, is replaced returns into the cell okay now in the case of using the to stop hydrochloric acid for medications, we have the H2 receptors, uh, histamine receptors, acranitidine, cimetidine, which they block here. These receptors are blocked, but the acid is not 100% blocked. But in the case of proton pump inhibitors, it blocks the pump, thereby the final output of acid, the final, final pathway in the production of acid is blocked. So there is a total blockage of acid secretion. Next, we go into this uh, concept of gastric mucosal barrier, which refers to a thin layer of mucus consisting of uh, polysaccharides, which are produced by the gastric cells. Okay, so these gastric cells produce mucus, which coats the in the duodenal surface of these cells, gastric cells, and this gastric mucus is acts as a protective mechanism 
from mechanical damage from the toxic effects of acid, pepsin and the contents of food. And this buffering capacity of this uh, mucus layer is enhanced by the bicarbonate ions that are also released into this mucus layer, okay, which makes it a alkaline surface. Breakdown of this gastric mucus barrier, such as by bile, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs, alcohol, trauma, and shock, will lead to surface erosions and ulceration. The high incidence of uh, stress ulceration in the stomach is because the stomach is the most sensitive uh, organ to ischemia in the surface, because surface, eh? and it's also the slowest to recover from this assault or ischemia. Next, we come to some important facts uh, about peptic ulcer. First, the role of hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is vital for the formation of a peptic ulcer, either gastric or uh, duodenal. All ulcers can heal in the absence of acid. So as long as if you don't have acid, all ulcers will heal. Second fact is very high acid levels, example in gastrinoma, will cause zollinger ellison syndrome with multiple duodenal ulcers. Okay, this is very, very another important factor. So these two fa uh, facts uh, show that hydrochloric acid uh, is very important for the ulcers to form. The other factors in, are duodenal and prepyloric ulcers usually have high level of acid. Gastric ulcers may have normal or lower acid levels. Genetic factors and social stress are only minor factors in the uh, formation of peptic ulcers. Unable, uh, it, is, it, will, it is not a, uh, possible, or in fact, it is unable to differentiate clinically between gastric and duodenal ulcer. Next, we come to the clinical features of peptic ulcer. First, you have the symptoms, which include the following, eh? dyspepsia, indigestion, epigastric discomfort, bloating, and burping. Pain is another very important symptom of uh, peptic ulcer. The pain is usually epigastric, gnawing in nature, and may radiate to the back. It is usually aggravated by sourish, spicy food, strong tea, coffee or alcohol and sometimes relieved by certain foods usually and this uh, pain is usually intermittent uh, and not constant periodicity of pain symptoms may disappear for a week or months then return again with similar uh, with a similar nature of pain it is usually associated with vomiting and nausea belching and bloating. There may be alteration in weight, usually weight loss, but sometimes can be weight gain. Now, among the signs, you have epigastric tenderness eh? without guarding. Okay, epigastric tenderness without guarding. Bella, which is non-specific. And this is usually due to slow bleeding of an ulcer, bleeding from an ulcer. Then you may have signs of, uh, signs of complications that, that may develop, such as bleeding patients may develop anemia and melina. And clinically, it is unable to differentiate clinically between GU from DU. Different, clinically, it is almost impossible. Huh? The advent of a flexible endoscope has drastically revolutionized the treatment and diagnosis of gastric and duodenal problems, especially peptic ulcer. Previously, it was the fiber optic endoscope. Now, it has been 
vastly improve with the, with the introduction of the solid state video camera. Okay, every aspect of the camera system has been improved. This picture shows you the, the camera stack, the video scope and the accessories that are being assembled. And here is the gastroscope. Okay, the modern gastroscope is not only much smaller, but it has got much more function than the previous generations. Okay, it has got advanced biopsy forceps, suction, flushing, and even uh, channels for polypectomy and coagulation and ligation, so many multiple multi-channel scope. This scope is not only used for diagnosis, but it also has great advantage in the therapeutic treatment of gastric and duodenal problems. Okay, now we come to the investigations for patients with duodenal ulcer, uh, peptic ulcer. First, for younger patients, non-invasive testing of H. pylori can be done, which include carbon-13 or carbon-14 urea blood test, serum antibodies to H. pylori, and stool antigen, uh, H. pylori antigen test. For older patients and those with red flag symptoms or with persistent symptoms despite normal treatment, the OGDS, upper endoscopy, esophageal gastrodidonoscopy must be done. This can be done together with the CLO test, which is a rapid urea test, which is where some tissue is taken from the stomach and placed in a test kit and observe the color change. Biopsy can also be done, and this must be done for all patients, older patients with gastric ulcers. Ultrasound scan and CT scans may be required sometimes when the diagnosis is not uh, confirmed. If the diagnosis is elusive, then you may have to do a CT ultrasound to rule out gallstones. CT scan to rule out some form of malignant lesions or growth in the stomach. Perioneal, which used to be a very popular investigation some years back, is rarely done these days. Okay, now we come to gastric ulcer. A few more detailed facts. Etiology, H. pylori and NSAIDs are proven etiological factors and this is together with smoking. It is less common than urinal ulcer. Male and female are about equal incidence. Usually older patients than those with duodenal ulcer. The ulcers tend to be very large compared to duodenal ulcer. The usual site is at the lesser curve, especially at the incisura angularis, yeah, lesser curve, huh? lower part of the lesser curve, body and antrum. Okay, this is uh, this on the left here is a barium meal of a patient with gastric ulcer. You see, can you see a large crater here? Filling defect and this side. Huh? So these are two the filling defects seen in a large uh, ulcer in the body of the stomach. These are endoscopic pictures, gastro gastroscopic pictures. See, ulcer here with slough. This looks like a clean ulcer. Most probably is a benign ulcer. Here there is some evidence of recent bleed, also a benign gastric ulcer. And these are the types of gastric ulcers according to the classification here is type 1 to type 5, okay, according to the location and also according to the level of acid, acid secretion. Most common is type 1, where it occurs in the gastric body along the lesser curve okay and acidity in these patients low uh, the level of acidity is much lower then the other one is the prepyloric region 
this prepyloric region, ulcers along the prepyloric region behave similar to duodenal ulcers, okay, and they have a high basal level of uh, acidity. Non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs can cause ulcers anywhere in the stomach, no specific sign. Okay, so these cause ulcers anywhere in the stomach, then these are the type 5. What are the complications of gastric ulcer? First, they can erode posteriorly. These ulcers in the posterior wall of the stomach can erode into the posteriorly into the pancreas splenic artery and trunk and rarely into the transverse colon. They can either cause fistula or hemorrhage, upper gastrointestinal bleeding, which can be massive at times. The second complication is fibrosis, which causes an hourglass contraction of the stomach, which is rarely seen, but more commonly pyloric stenosis and when the ulcer is located at the pyloric region. Chronic fibrosis causes pyloric stenosis which lead to gastric outlet obstruction or COO. The third and important complication is the malignant change. Gastric ulcers have a potential to become malignant turning to adenocarcinoma of the stomach which is a scot does not have very good prognosis as it presents late. This can be diagnosed easily these days by flexible endoscopy or OGDS and it's important to take multiple biopsies around the periphery of the ulcer all around the periphery of the ulcer so as not to miss a carcinoma. This is a picture of a large gastric ulcer on barium meal and massive, which cause massive constriction or great tremendous constriction of the body of the stomach. This is the gross specimen showing you the ulcer with a lot of fibrosis leading to narrowing and constriction. This leads to a dilated proximal and distal segment and it resembles an hourglass as shown in this picture here. So this is known as a hourglass deformity of gastric ulcer. As for duodenal ulcers, the etiology is the same, right? the same factors as for gastric ulcer, H. pylori and NSAIDs plus smoking. With the widespread use of anti-secretory drugs like uh, histamine receptor blockers and PPI, the H. pylori eradication therapy has reduced the incidence of duodenal ulcers today. Still, it is more common in men and age is older okay, than it used to occur previously. The most common site is the first part of the duodenum D1 and chronic fibrosis of this region can cause pyloric stenosis. Erosion of the ulcer into the posterior wall of the duodenum can cause erosion of the gastroduodenal artery and cause massive bleeding. This is a picture of an ulcer in the first part of the duodenum. This is an anterior ulcer which is benign looking and uh, there's no evidence of bleeding. This is a barium meal picture of the same patient with the ulcer. Then you see there is an ulcer crater here. Okay, this is a duodenal ulcer. Duodenal ulcers usually tend to be uh, multiple, more than one ulcer can be seen. Both posterior and anterior wall of the first part of the duodenum can be involved. And such ulcers are known as kissing ulcers here, anterior and posterior walls. The anterior ulcers tend to perforate and they erode through the mucosa which has become a continent. 
The posterior duodenal ulcer tend to bleed as they erode into the gastroduodenal artery which runs on its posterior surface. The important fact factor is rarely duodenal ulcers are rarely malignant. In fact, duodenal ulcers in principle are always considered to be benign. The picture here shows you an anterior duodenal ulcer with a crater here. Okay, on very main piece, and this is a kissing ulcer. The discovery of Helicobacter pylori has revolutionized the whole treatment and management of gastritis and peptic ulcer. In 1980, Warren and Marshall of Australia proved the Cox postulates to be true for helicobacter, helicobacter pylori infection causing gastritis. For that, both received the Nobel Peace Prize for Medicine and Physiology in 2005. Originally called Campylobacter pyloridis, it is helicobacter is transmitted by the fecal oral route and is the most common infection of the stomach today. H. pylori produces urease which hydrolyzes the urea into ammonia which is an alkaline solution which causes more gastrin release and that really uh, results in the gast, uh, gastric acid hypersecretion. Helicobacter pylori can be detected by the CLO test, which is a rapid test, which is a commercially available urease test kit, which is performed on gastric biopsies. It can also be detected in, by the urea prep test using TECT 13C or 14C TECT urea. Okay. In this test, the patient is asked to take urea tacked with 13 or 14C carbon and then this urea is then broken down or hydrolyzed by the urease produced by the H. pylori into ammonia and carbon dioxide. And this tacked carbon, uh, carbon in the carbon dioxide is then detected in the patient's breath test. The other test is serum antibodies, especially IgG to H. pylori, can also be detected in the in the, the blood of the patients who have been infected with H. pylori. And the other one more test is your antigen test in the stools for H. pylori antigen. Okay, what is Helicobacter pylori? H. pylori is a gram-negative spiral-shaped bacillus found in the mucous layer of those with duodenal ulcers in 90% or gastric ulcers in 70% of cases. It survives in the stomach by producing an alkaline environment, micro environment, and induces an inflammatory response in the mucosa leading to gastritis and ulceration. This it does by first invoking a cytokine and interleukin driven inflammatory response, increasing gastric acid secretion in both the acute and chronic phases of infection by inducing release of histamine which acts on parietal cells and damaging the host mucus secretion by degrading the surface glycoprotein and down regulating the bicarbonate production. H. pylori infection, or how does it cause ulceration? It leads to the disruption of the gastric mucus barrier, which I explained earlier, by enzymes and production of cytotoxins that incite inflammatory response by neutrophils, macrophages, and lymphocytes. And this causes type B gastritis, which can progress on to cause ulcers. The enteral mucosal biopsy 
will be able to show colonization with H. pylori. And this can be detected by the GIMSA stain. Next, a few words about this Zollinger Ellison syndrome or ZES. Zollinger Ellison syndrome refers to a triad of conditions. First, severe peptic ulcer, which tend to be multiple, frequent, and non healing ulcers. Secondly, gastric hyper acid hypersecretion. And thirdly, the existence of gastrinoma, which produced a high level of gastrin and hydrochloric acid. The characteristic finding, which is diagnostic, diagnostic is a fasting gastrin level of more than 1000 picograms per meal. One third of these cases are discovered as part of the MEN2 syndrome which is multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1 syndrome, which involves the pancreas, the pituitary, and parathyroid. So, in these cases, further investigation for MEN syndrome, MEN syndrome, are often warranted. Now we come to the treatment of peptic ulcer. This can be divided into two, three categories, non-pharmacological treatment, pharmacological treatment and surgery. Non-pharmacological conservative treatment involves lifestyle modifications, avoid smoking and alcohol consumption, change of diet, avoid sourish or spicy foods, avoid strong tea or coffee, and most important, is to avoid NSAIDs, smoking, or other drugs such as steroids. The pharmacological in treatment includes antacids for symptomatic relief to neutralize the increased amount of hydrochloric acid in the stomach, H2 receptor antagonists such as ranitidine and uh, cimetidine, which block the H2 receptors. And I said this is not a full it does not block the acid totally, it partially blocks the production of acid. Use of proton inhibitors which totally block the acid production. These two have revolutionized the treatment of peptic ulcer disease. The other one which is important is eradication of H. pylori infection. As we know, 90% of the patients with duodenal ulcer and 70% of patients with uh, gastric ulcer have F H, pi uh, H. pylori positive. Therefore, eradication of this bacteria will drastically reduce the incidence of these ulcers. And last is surgery. The medical treatment involves there are the drugs that are used is here, agent, antacids, H2 antagonists, proton pump in the inhibitors, so, uh, sucralfate is here, uh, mucos, uh, mucosal protective agents, cytoprotective agents which protect the mucosa of the stomach and duodenum, and prostaglandins which inhibit the secretion, increase endogenous mucosal defense. Okay, now let's summarize the treatment of peptic ulcer that, that is uh, being practiced today. Okay, today modern day treatment is the triple regime which, in, which aims to heal the ulcer at the same time to eradicate the H. pylori. This includes two amoxicillin and one PPI. The commonly used is clarithromycin, amoxicillin, omeprazole or esamaprazole whatever PPI. And this regime is given for six weeks, six to eight weeks actually, six weeks minimum until the ulcer is healed. And in some patients, especially high risk patients, a repeat OGDS may be necessary to ensure the healing of the ulcer before stopping the treatment. 
and in some patients who are elderly with multiple medical comorbidity, it may be necessary to maintain this PPI for a longer period, okay, so as to prevent the recurrence of the ulcer. Having said this, the other important measures that must be followed is to avoid NSAIDs, uh, toxic or noxious food, smoking and alcohol. Of late, another group of drugs have entered the market after the PPI and this is the new drug known as the potassium which belongs to the potassium competitive acid blocker, PCAB, which is also an inhibitor of the hydrogen potassium ATPase. Okay? It is called venoprazan. Eh? Venoprazan, which is believed or reported to be more potent, long-acting and early reversal of side effects. This is yet to be uh, tested with more trials. The indications for surgery which is becoming less and less these days. Um, nowadays, only less than 20%, maybe even less than that, huh, of patients require surgery for the control or treatment of peptic ulcers, usually due to failure of medical treatment. The present regime of treatment for medical uh, for peptic ulcer is very effective. As a result of that, surgery becomes less necessary. Complications of a peptic ulcer usually treated surgically, such as perforation, obstruction, gastric outlet obstruction, bleeding from the duodenal ulcer, and malignancy in, in, in gastric ulcers is an indication for surgery. Surgery for peptic ulcer. Gastric ulcer is treated with Bildrot gastrectomy and gastroduodenostomy. For duodenal ulcers, there are a number of options. Traditionally, Bildrot 2 gastrectomy with a bypass operation known as gastrojejunostomy, which is the polyar type of gastrectomy. Then you have a number of vagotomies, truncal vagotomy and drainage which includes a pyloroplasty or gastrojejunostomy, truncal vagotomy and entrectomy, which will not need the, the drainage procedure, and a highly selective vagotomy, HSV, which preserves the vagal trunks but divides the supply to the body and the fundus. Having said that, I must admit that surgery for peptic ulcer is rarely done today due to the effective drugs or medical treatment that is available. This slide summarizes the various types of surgery that are carried out or that were used to be very popular for peptic ulcer disease. The first one is known as the Bildrot 1 gast uh, gastrectomy, which is for gastric ulcer. It's a gastrectomy plus gastroduodenostomy. Okay, this is for gastric ulcer. For duodenal ulcer, the main operation used to be a Bildrot 2 gastrectomy. So Bildrot 2 with a gastrojejunostomy. Then there were a number of Vagotomies that were used to be done before. The main one is a truncal vagotomy plus drainage. Where the anterior and posterior vagal trunks are identified and transected, and a segment of it is resected. This is followed, accompanied by a drainage procedure, which consists of either a pyroplasty or a gastrojejunostomy to drain the antrum, which will otherwise become static due to vagotomy. The most specific vagotomy is known as the highly selective vagotomy or HSV, where 
The vagal trunks are left behind, preserved, but the branches to the antrum and the body are resected eh, by a longitudinal superficial incision, leaving behind the terminal part, the branches of the terminal end of the antrum, known as the crow's foot, which look like the foot of the crow. This is to prevent stasis and avoid the use of a drainage procedure. Okay, what are the sequelae of peptic ulcer surgery or the complications of peptic ulcer surgery? These are the long list of complications among which the most common is recurrent ulceration. Eh? And these ulcers usually recur in the stoma of the, of the Bildrot II gastrectomy stump and can also present with bleeding, perforation and a gastrocolic fistula. Other complications include the effects or sequelae of removing a large part of the stomach is small stomach syndrome, bilious vomiting and dumping syndrome. Others include iron and B12 deficiency anemia, gallstones after truncal vagotomy and malignant change in the in the sto uh, stump of the stomach or the stoma gastrojejunostomy stoma that is the left behind complications of peptic ulcer are very 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 important and this will be covered in the, another lecture because it's quite a long topic so i shall just list out this list uh, list of complications that are commonly seen perforation of peptic ulcer okay this one see a duodenal ulcer the first part of the duodenum there's a perforation hole in the ulcer second is bleeding see this has eroded the gastroduodenal artery and then there's a spurting of blood which is a bleeding peptic ulcer stenosis pylorus because of the ulcer chronic ulceration and scarring it narrows the spylorus and results in gastric outlet obstruction or GOO, G -O -O. and the last major complication is a gastric ulcer becoming malignant transformation okay this can be done can be detected easily and diagnosed easily by a multiple gastric biopsy okay what are the key points to take home from this lecture today first H. pylori and NSAIDs are the most common causes of peptic ulcer disease conservative management through lifestyle changes and PPI therapy is the mainstay of treatment in most cases any patient with red flag symptoms or not responding to conservative management should be referred for urgent upper GI endoscopy. Surgical management of uncomplicated peptic ulcer is rare today. Most surgical management uh, treatment is only carried out for complications of peptic ulcer. Gastric cancer or a malignant gastric ulcer must always be kept in mind and a OGDS and biopsy requested when necessary.